Welcome all junior employees, assistant to the detectives, and assistant detectives to the overviews of the Anti-Strangling Task Force. This is the overview for Great Scott Film Forensics. In this overview, I'm going to be covering the significance of movies, movies referenced and, and their role in sort of helping us decipher the greatest story of the Scranton Strangler mystery, because there are numerous references to various movies uh, in the show. Being a movie buff or a cinephile is a repeated motif throughout the show. We have the example of Michael when he's working at the call center. His work colleagues tell him that he should review movies. Daryl tells us that he's a cinephile. I'm into The Godfather because I'm a cinephile. Uh, when Michael's nephew comes into work, he tells us he's into cinema. I love cinema. My favorite movies are Citizen Kane and The Boondock Saints. You also have that little joust between Dwight and Andy uh, about how much do you know about film. So there is a repeated motif which relates to how much you know about film and movies. And this is critical because the references to the movies fill in various gaps and provide us with the building blocks of Dwight's life. Now in the Extraterrestrial Time Traveling Task Force overview, I did touch on the similarities between Back to the Future and various time traveling elements in the show. So I'm not going to be repeating those things, but there is one parallel that I'm going to mention in this episode, and it's this concept of standing on graves. In Back to the Future 3, when they finally find the DeLorean in the abandoned mine shaft, Ma Marty finds Doc's grave. The Doc from 1985 that gets transported back to 1885, they find his grave, and then Doc says to Marty, don't stand there. Who the hell is Clara? Marty, please don't stand there! Oh, right, sorry. Now in the episode Chair Model, uh, when they go to see the grave site of the girl that died in the car accident who was the chair model, Dwight makes a concerted effort to step over the grave. We also have accusations against Toby in the episode Fun Run, whether Toby was responsible for the desecration of an Indian burial site, and Michael even says, did anyone park on a grave site? Did anyone do anything involving an Indian burial ground? Like what? Like park on it. Or dig up a body. Toby? Do you have anything you want to tell us? No, I did not violate an Indian burial ground. This links into the motif of mummies. Uh, Creed dresses up as a mummy. We find that in another Halloween episode that Kevin is terrified of mummies. And in the episode where Dwight wants another interview for the manager position, he dresses up as a burn victim. But for all intents and purposes, he's really dressed up as a mummy. So we have this link to the grave and to mummies. And that links into the next movie that I want to sort of touch on here, which is The Crow. And we find out The Crow is Dwight's favorite movie when they're playing Desert Island and everyone's listing their favorite movies and Dwight says that his favorite movie is The Crow. Dwight, all-time favorite movie. The Crow. The general plot of the movie is Brandon Lee plays Eric Draven. What seems to be some sort of an occult group on Devil's Night goes out, they shoot him, they murder him, they throw him out of a window, and they also rape and beat his uh, fiance, who he was going to marry the following day. And she goes through, you know, 30 hours of significant pain and trauma, and then she finally dies as well. And at some point, I think it's about a year later, Eric Draven is raised from the dead and he crawls out of his grave and then goes out to seek vengeance against those people who committed these crimes against him and his fiance. Now the link that Eric Draven has to the temporal world is the crow. So at some point the the villains of the movie try and kill the crow and, and, and by injuring the crow they actually injure Eric Draven's supernatural abilities because he's able to take bullet shots and, and he has various other powers that are sort 
sort of bestowed upon him and he's he doesn't know how any of this happened he questions that himself and there are definitely supernatural and even christian themes in the sense of sort of divine judgment and there are a number of sort of uh, biblical references in the movie as well given the fact that this is dwight's favorite movie and we have a very strong link to mummies to graves and as i'll touch on a little bit later in this overview coming out of the grave right there is a couple of parallels that i want to sort of draw with the office scranton strangler mystery and this movie those things are as i already said coming out of the grave supernatural and occult references incest and rape vengeance adoption brothels drugs and clowns now to start with coming out of the grave in the episode 725 search committee this is the episode where you know dwight has fired the gun in the previous episode and now they need to find another manager and then the search committee has started to make sure there are no more mistakes with who ends up being manager and, and obviously dwight this is the episode where dwight dresses up as jacques souvenir and in this episode dwight is really pushing to have another interview so dwight goes outside for a walk with jim in the car park trying to convince him to give him another interview dwight then says the following the hand that reaches from the grave to grip your throat is the strong hand you want on the wheel. Okay, that's vivid. The hand that reaches from the grave to grab your throat is the strong hand you want on the wheel. And this is later on also repeated by Kelly because he's obviously offered Kelly the same sort of privileges if they make him manager and she quotes the same quote. It makes me think about something that my grandfather used to say, which is that sometimes the hand that jumps out of the grave and grabs you around the throat that is the hand that you want on the wheel. Now, it's quite obvious that Dwight is referring to himself here. In his example, he is the strong hand that's coming out of the grave to grip your throat. Now, there are obviously immediately very strong links to strangling and, and the Scranton Strangler. I mean, we're talking about a hand gripping you by the throat. But more interestingly, this hand that grips the person by the throat comes out of the grave. If we put the whole picture together, we have references to desecrating or standing or parking on graves. We have a mummy motif in the show. We then also have The Crow being Dwight's favorite movie. And then we have this line from Dwight, the hand coming up out of the grave. The movie really forms the linchpin or the keystone to wholly understanding uh, these things put together. As I said, in isolation, it might be difficult to come to the conclusion I'm about to share with you, but the movie provides that missing link. And what this ultimately implies is that at some point, Dwight, came out of the grave like Eric Draven. It would explain his reference about the hand coming up out of the grave and in the crow we have a resurrection of a being who then goes out on a path of vengeance. This is really what that movie or the reference to the crow coupled with the other references allow us to come to this conclusion. So it's really the movie. It's the reference to the movie that fills in the gap. It must be the fact that Dwight relates to that movie the most. And the central theme is resurrection from the dead. This is what brings me to the divine or supernatural uh, versus also occult references. The group of people in The Crow that are responsible for, for all this evil doing seem to be part of some sort of an anarchist satanic cult. They go out and do all their work on, on Devil's Night, right? So there's a strong link to sort of satanism and, and evil in the movie. Now there are also a number of references to cults in the office and the one that you know automatically comes to mind is Creed because you know Creed tells us that he's been both a leader and a follower of a cult. I've been involved in a number of cults both as a leader and a follower. You have more fun as a follower but you make more money as a leader. And I mentioned in the must know information that Creed is Dwight's adopted father right so th there is a link again to this sort of occultic theme. Now there's also an inverse relationship here. In The Crow Eric Draven is assumed and again I'm sure there are opinions on this but Eric is assumed to perhaps be raised from the dead by God. Uh, there's that reference to, you know, a Bible verse, which is, uh, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, right? I guess the implication is that 
Eric Draven was raised to the dead and that God will enact divine judgment in this life against the people who committed those crimes. Now, in Dwight's case, I believe there's evidence to suggest that it's the inverse, because in the episode where Dwight says he's going to be uh, Jim's boss, he says, uh, welcome to Hotel Hell. Check-in time is now, check-out time is never. And he says that he runs the whole joint with Satan. Welcome to the Hotel Hell. Check-in time is now, check-out time is never. Can I have a late check-out? I'll have to talk to the manager. You're not the manager, even in your own fantasy? I'm the owner. The co-owner. With Satan. This is a stark contrast with what you would think Dwight's personality is, considering his his meant to have been brought up by the Amish and by a highly religiously conservative uh, community, yet he seems to not only sort of affiliate with Satan, uh, there is numerous references uh, throughout the show where, where Dwight seems to relate most to the anti-heroes or villains of various movies. I like to think of myself as a brilliant scientist who will stop at nothing to remake the world. Like, not Dr. Moreau, someone good. Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll, not them. Doctor. There's also a reference in Dwight and Angela's parenting contract, a little caveat in the event that the child is a devil's son. So again, this is a parallel, but it's also a contrasting concept. I, I would say Eric Draven in The Crow is a being of divine judgment on the side of God, whereas in Dwight's case, I think it's a demonic influence in his resurrection that I believe happened. I mean, there's even references to Dwight and most trying to reanimate bulls. So there's a strong link to sort of various sorcery, if you want to put it that way, and, and the dark arts in Dwight's case, albeit that that he has that link to the Amish. And that can be easily explained by, you know, Dwight's Nazi past and how his parents really wanted to find a community where they could blend in and, and sort of disguise themselves, right? But the main point I'm trying to make here, guys, is as opposed to Eric Draven, which is meant to be a divine being sent by God, I believe Dwight is the opposite. He's resurrected and, and really has a demonic influence. A another couple of concepts that are also referenced in the movie are incest and rape. In the second episode of season one, Diversity Day, in the deleted scenes, Michael tries to make his own diversity acronym, and it ends up spelling incest. Um... That spells incest. Another uh, example where sort of incest is is referenced or suggested is when Andy goes to Erin's house because Erin gets sick. They were meant to go on a date and Andy's getting a little bit self-conscious or insecure. So he wants to go to her house. And that's when he finds out that Erin lives with her stepbrother. And Andy comments how they were living together in the formative years. So the implication, again, is some sort of incest implication. And in the movie The Crow, the occult leaders are brothers and sister. They say that they have the same father, but different mothers. So the, the cult leaders are in an incestuous relationship. Now, I'm not going to go into details now of how that relates to the mystery, right? But this concept of, of incest specifically between adopted siblings is something that does have a part to play. And, and I guess this links into the Bob Kazimakis' Sex Investigation Squad. But, in, you know, I guess in, in this overview, I'm really drawing the parallel or the link to The Crow again, which is another concept that we could source to some degree from The Crow. Also, rape. Um, again, a, a very dark theme. And the whole movie, The Crow, actually, if you've seen it, is quite a dark movie. Even the imagery and the cinematography and the music, it's, it's very dark, right? But rape is mentioned when Michael is going through the complaints uh, that turn Toby keeps on filing away. There's a murder-suicide mention and also a rape mentioned. And Toby is a lazy detective who has decided that these armed robberies and rapes and murder-suicides are not important enough to solve. Well, you know what? I have a problem with that. Right, and obviously uh, Eric Draven's fiance, uh, she ends up getting raped and, and beaten and, and goes through a very torturous and hellish uh, experience, right? So I'm not exactly sure where the rape fits in to the story, right? It's something for the Kazamaka Sex Investigation Squad, but it's, again, another parallel that we can make between the show and the crow. Adoption. 
is another uh, theme. Uh, obviously, we know there's numerous references to adoption throughout the office. I'm not going to sort of pin uh, any individual ones here, but adoption is a significant part of the mystery. We have the young girl, Sarah, who is adopted by Eric and Shelley because her mother uh, works in a brothel and she's addicted to morphine. And again, drugs are a part of the office. And we even have uh, references to heroin by Creed in certain episodes, right? And we even have references that the office used to be a brothel. So this concept of prostitution and, and drugs and in the case of uh, Sarah getting adopted by Eric and Shelley, concepts that we can see parallels between the crow and various things that happen in the show. Then the last one I want to touch on is clown. Obviously, Eric Draven's uh, face paint makes him sort of look like a scary clown. Various characters in the movie sort of poke fun at his clown face paint. And the two examples that come to mind is the clown painting, which is sort of fixed into Jim's parents' house. We've also got that clown wrestling poster that Dwight uh, puts in his childcare center that he starts. So there's a couple of references to clowns as well. So you can see there are multiple parallels we can make with the crow, with the most significant one being this concept of coming out of the grave. But they're not the only movies referenced in the show. There are numerous movies uh, referenced in the show and all of them have relevance uh, to varying degrees of waiting is the way I would put it. To go to one that I think has less waiting is the movie Showtime with Eddie Murphy and Robert De Niro. It's, it's a great movie. I'm a big fan of that movie as well. Now we can draw some parallels to this movie. I mean, first of all, uh, Michael on a number of occasions uh, says it's Showtime uh, in the last Dundee's episode. So when he's talking to D'Angelo in the bathroom, he go, you know, he slaps D'Angelo and says it's showtime. One, two, three. It's showtime. All right, here we go. And uh, then when they're trying to beat uh, Danny Cordray in the sale, Michael tries to get everyone to say it's showtime. On the count of three, it's showtime. Ready? One. No, nope, not doing that. I've been on showtime mode since breakfast. Okay, Are you not? All right, just forget it then. Showtime. It's showtime. Oh. Never mind. Right, so we have a couple of references to Showtime. Now, the basic plot of the movie is a TV network wants to make a reality show on real police officers and follow them around and beam this stuff up live. That's the simple plot of the of the movie. Now, there are some parallels. Obviously, police officers are referenced a number of times in the show. There are also certain various fan theories which suggest that The Office may not be a documentary, that it may, in fact, be a reality show like Big Brother or The Apprentice, right? And that'll be something that Rogue Squadron will sort of be looking into, right? So there are parallels to Showtime, but certain movies seem to have more relevance and have additional references. And the movie I want to use in this example is Legends of the Fall. The only reason I saw Legends of the Fall is because it was one of Meredith's favorite movies when they were playing Desert Island. So I wanted to see if there was any sort of links or anything peculiar about the movie that could link back to the mystery. This movie is not just referenced by title. In the movie, and I'm not going to go over the plot of the movie just yet, right? But uh, if you've seen the movie, you'll know that Alfred at one point leaves to Helena to start his business ventures and to make something of himself. And he writes a letter back to his mother. And he starts off the letter with, Dearest Mother. September 7th, 1915. Dearest Mother, I think I may have found my place in this world. Now this is a throwback to the Gettysburg episode of The Office. If you remember, Dwight is making a big fuss how the Battle of Schrute Farms was the northernmost battle in the Civil War. And he's at odds with Oscar. And they finally go to the Civil War historian. Uh, and he goes through the files and he goes through the records or whatever. And he finds the information around Schrute Farms. And we actually have a letter that's written by the occupants of Schrute Farms, and it starts with exactly the same delivery. Dearest Mother. Dearest Mother, I'm sorry it has been so long since my last letter. It is three months since I arrived at Schrute Farms. Now you can see that this goes beyond a parallel. We've literally ported scripting from the movie into the office, right? So what that tells me is there's more significance to the movie in relating not only to the Scranton Strangler mystery, but also understanding Meredith. 
And there's a couple of parallels that we could sort of comment on with Legends of the Fall. For example, there are three brothers. You know, Jim has two brothers. This links into sort of the curse of three. Uh, mother issues, right? Uh, the motherly figure plays a very important role in the Scranton Strangler mystery. And the mother leaves the family because she can't handle the weather and she moves to the East Coast. And, you know, Tristan, for example, played by Brad Pitt, feels some level of abandonment with his mother. And, and you know, the relationship between Dwight and his mother is integral to understanding this mystery. Love triangles. All three brothers end up getting involved with Susanna in one way or another. And again, we have dozens upon dozens of love triangles in the office. Native American themes are a strong theme in uh, Legends of the Fall, and we have a number of references to Native Americans in the office as well. World Wars and Germans, uh, another theme that parallels. By now in this overview, you should realize that movie references and the porting of various movie lines into the show are not just done simply for cultural references or for fun or for humor's sake, right? They play an integral role role in understanding elements of the Scranton Strangler mystery. This is what leads me to the specific assignment for Great Scott Film Forensics. In the episode The Merger, when Andy and Dwight finally meet, they have that little back and forth regarding who is the higher ranking member in the office. And then, you know, Andy says, I'm a director, which is the highest role on film set. And do you know anything about film? And then Dwight says, I've seen 240 of them. And I'm a director, which on a film set is the highest title there is. Do you know anything about film? I know everything about film. I've seen over 240 of them. Congratulations. Now, this is a clue, guys, and this is actually one of the mysteries or one of the puzzles of the show. It's to work out what that list of 240 movies is. Now, there's a very comprehensive list already done by a person named Elton on Letterboxd, and there are 179 movies put on this list. That means that there are 61 movies missing. And it is going to be up to us not only to watch the movies that are referenced, to see if there's any links and to, and to grade their relevance. We need to work out what these, are, you know, 61 missing movies are. Now, I wanted to share one example of a movie that I believe I found that should be part of this list. And it's a good example where not only is scripting sometimes ported across from movies, and not only are movies referenced by name, but we need to keep in mind that movies might be referenced simply by plot. And this includes characters describing plot or even things that perhaps happen in the show. The plot of various episodes could actually be indicative of the plot of famous movies. Now, in the episodes 405 and 406 launch party, this is the Pizza by Alfredo episode where they take the pizza guy hostage... In the deleted scenes, we see Kevin actually detail the plot of a movie. In every good hostage movie, during the part where it gets really tense and you don't know whether the bad guys are going to let the hostages go free, the cops order pizza. Now, I believe this movie to be Inside Man with Denzel Washington, Clive Owen and Jodie Foster. This is a great movie, by the way, guys. If you haven't seen this movie, it's a fantastic movie. It's epic. From beginning to end, it's just, it's a great thriller. I highly recommend it. Now, I want to reference the similarities between this movie and various things that happen in the office. Now, the basic plot of the movie is a bunch of bank robbers have taken uh, an entire bank hostage. They're trying to rip off the bank. The cops surround the building. And towards the end of the movie, they, they steal whatever they wanted to steal. And the robbers actually walk out of the bank disguised as the hostages. Except for the primary uh, robber or the, or the leader of the pack, if you want to pull it that way. They actually build like a little uh, apartment in the back of the bank. And he hides there for a couple of weeks. 
and he finally just walks out of the bank undetected uh, with everything that they've stolen. Right, so it's it's a fantastic plot for a movie. Now, here are the similarities between the movie and things that happen in the office. The first is pizza. So Kevin is correct. A, it is a fantastic movie. It's one of the, it's a great hostage movie, but they do actually order pizza as well as sandwiches once the hostages get hungry, which leads me to the next similarity. They hide uh, surveillance devices in the food. And the type of surveillance device, which is really interesting that they also send into the bank, is actually pens. Pens that have like a recording or, you know, have a microphone function, which obviously reminds us of the pen that Dwight uses uh, to spy on Jim. So a very strong similarity there. The other interesting concept is counter surveillance. The robbers actually send a surveillance device in to the police. The surveillance van that they have, they actually send surveillance back to them as well. So you have this sort of concept of dual surveillance going on. Another similarity is Sadiq. If you remember the first day that Sadiq rocks up to the office, Michael thinks He's a terrorist and he tells everyone in the office to be quiet, right? And this is actually mirrored by Vikram in the movie Inside Man because the robbers send Vikram out to the police and he's tied up and he's, and he's gagged. And when they take off his hood, they see that he's wearing a turban because he's a Sikh. And then one of the cops is like, oh, oh my God, it's an Arab, right? So you have the same confusion of uh, an Indian Sikh confused for a terrorist, both in the show and in the movie. Nazis. So the lead banker in the movie, I don't know if he's exactly a Nazi, but the, the Nazis ended up making him rich because he did what the Nazis sort of required of him. So he was, you know, how would you put it, maybe complicit or condoning of their actions in what they were doing during the Second World War. And that's ultimately how he ends up becoming a wealthy billionaire banker. And one of the things that the robbers are stealing are the documents that pertain to his Nazi past. So we obviously know that Dwight has a strong Nazi link and how his uh, ancestors actually came to America and, and came to be part of the Amish community is something that we're going to be looking into. Diamonds. Now this is something I haven't really touched on and I'm not going to go into too much detail but I, I strongly believe that there is some sort of Nazi treasure that is a part of the Scranton Strangler mystery and something that Dwight, Creed and Kevin, they're trying to retrieve this treasure that's hidden down a well. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but in the movie Inside Man, part of what the banker has in his vault isn't just the documents. He's got diamonds, and from the top of my memory, they were stolen from like a Jewish, a French Jewish family, and it's basically like Nazi gold, or you know what I mean, war crime loot, if you want to put it that way. So that actually links into the Scranton Strangler mystery as well, although I haven't really touched on that in much detail. Just on that point, when Michael's doing his improv, he actually talks about, I know where you hid the diamonds and... Well, you didn't, because I know where you hid the diamonds. I've been on to you and your little friends for weeks. So we have a couple of references to diamonds in the show and treasure as well. Now you can see, guys, there are numerous strong links to this movie. Now if we want to compare it to The Crow. The crux of the movie The Crow is Eric Draven coming back to life from the grave, rising from the dead. That's the linchpin. There's a whole bunch more happening in the way of narrative and plot. But if we're, if we're to boil it down to like, what is, the, what is the central core of the theme? It's a man rises from the dead and seeks vengeance. So what would we say about Inside Man? I mean, in my view, the crux of the movie is the ending where we have a thief who's hiding in the place that he's stealing from, right? He hides in the bank with the stuff he's stolen. Now, I think this can strongly be linked to Dwight and his financial fraud. And I go into, obviously, a lot of detail in that in the uh, Colorblind Financial Fraud Regulator episode, right? But you could argue that Dwight is effectively stealing from Dunder Mifflin whilst he's at Dunder Mifflin. So is that the primary concept that's being communicated to us? The other one that I think we should also be mindful of is the fact that in Inside Man, 
he hides in in the bank in like a safe room or something like that. So perhaps the concept of a safe room forms one of the building blocks uh, of the Scranton Strangler mystery. Just things to keep in mind. But in my view, one of these 61 missing movies is undoubtedly Inside Man. There are simply too many similarities and concepts that seem to be ported across for it not to be. So that plot that, that Kevin outlines it's got to be this movie and it's a good example how we need to sort of think a little bit deeper guys perhaps the description of a plot is going to give us one of these movies right it's it's always easy when we're just looking at scripting or, or movies mentioned by name that's simple right and I can't say this one was particularly hard in in, in my opinion to be honest but you know, it could get harder than this. And I've actually got another example which I've left out today. And when we get to those episodes, I'm gonna I'm gonna share those examples then, right? But Inside Man, without a shadow of a doubt, is one of these 61. So guys, that's the overview done. Uh, movies play a very important role in helping us understand the gaps in the Scranton Strangler mystery. Our assignment, above and beyond what I've already mentioned in regards to motif, symbolism, and theme, is going to be to compile this list of 240 films. We're going to watch those movies as they're referenced, right? So it'll be homework every week to watch whichever movies are referenced. We're going to watch them. We're also going to draw parallels where appropriate. I need to reiterate, these movies are inspiration. It doesn't mean that we've copied them like for like, but concepts, plots, and themes are used as inspiration, and we need to sort of be able to decipher what they are. So if you're a TV and movie buff, if you've seen 240 films, then the Great Scott Film Forensics is the team for you. Welcome to the Anti-Strangling Task Force.